Call to duty the militant church partisan assembly of the Church of Pentecost. It's on the move. Seven days of prayer and fasting from July 8th to the 14th, 2019. That the gates of hell shall not prevail. Put on the whole armor of God, draw your sword of the word. With precision, get involved. Time 6.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. each night. 8 p.m. to 12.30 p.m. half night service on the Friday day. Leave the crowd behind and get involved. For more information, call the numbers on your screen. Don't be dropped out. Call the American dream of owning your own house is a reality now. Comfort Realty will represent you in selling, leasing, purchasing commercial property or residential in DMV area. Count on our ability to offer the best in the market DMV. The American dream come alive with us. Come let's talk at 1835 University Boulevard, number 314, Hayesville, Maryland, 20783. Office phone number 301-326-1976. Office fax 301-328-0406. Phone number 301-222-7732. We fully the church if we take the resources out of it. And the Bible mentioned their names. One was Mary Magdalene. And he went further and said demons had been taken out of her. And you could see the appreciation. So maybe basically she was given out of appreciation for what God has done. Then he went and mentioned Joanna. And Joanna's husband was steward for, for, for Herod, a politician. So basically, the wife of a politician was part of the women. And they were bringing resources. So the church needs money. And the reason, maybe you ask yourself, why did Jesus need money? You realize that Jesus had a treasure. His name was Judas Iscariot. And basically, he failed. But the essence of having a treasure so that there will be resources for the ministry of Jesus. And everywhere they went, they had obligations to meet. They needed things. They needed food to eat. When they went to the market, they were paying for the food. So these women were providing out of their resources so that the founder of the church, Jesus Christ, can have a successful ministry. In our days, it is still the same. The next scripture that I will read with regards to this is Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verse, verse 34 to 36, and I read. It says, nor was there anyone among the who lacked. They're talking about the first church, the apostles and the new disciples. It says, nor was there anyone among the who lacked. For all who were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds to the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having learned, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So this is how the first church survived. People became givers in the church. People ensured that the apostles could dedicate their time to preach the gospel. Some sold lands, and the church also had resources to take care of the needy. So someone may ask, why, why does the church need money? There are several reasons. One of the basic reasons is that every church, every church needs dedicated men and women who will do its work. They may be the pastors, they may be the administrators, they may be the, the helpers in the church. And the only way we can get people to leave their secular work and be 100% dedicated to the, the kingdom business is to make sure that the church can at least take care of them, pay them. So if you're listening to me and you are one of those people who is denying your church your resources, you're denying the church of critical men and women who will be dedicated to the business. I can guarantee to anyone listening to me, when you give to our church, Church of Pentecost, you're not giving to a pastor. You have not given to a pastor. You're giving directly to the church. And the money goes into the business of the church. So I want to encourage anyone listening to us who is listening to all these falsehoods, all these fallacies going about. I see giving to the church 
It's not more than, as he given to the church, it's not what God expected. Jesus himself received from people. The apostles received from people. The church will continue to need and receive from people. So the first reason... So before you go on, so before you go on, if you look at the Jesus' ministry and then the apostles' ministry, for, from the examples that you've cited from um, Luke chapter 8 and Acts chapter 5, you look at them from a voluntary point of view. Mm -hmm. came willingly and offered to Jesus and they offered to the apostles that the work will go on. I believe that they saw the need for the work. Mm -hmm. You have people who see the need that the ministry must go on. That's the reason why it will propel them to give. If people don't see the need, why should I have to give? Um, how do we coin that, that people will see the need to give and, to the ministry? And, 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 and I'm, I'm very happy with the question you've, you've asked. And that is the reason why we are doing this, so that we can project and let people know that if you are in the church, there is a need for you to support it. And mm -hmm. number two, Many times, if people will just sit down and consider, they will realize the need. But mm -hmm. a lot of times, people ignore what they're saying. Let's say you go to a church. There is air condition running in the church. Mm -hmm. There is electricity running in the church. There are new chairs in the church. The church is doing things. You go to a church, they organize a marriage seminar. You go to a church, they organize parties for children. You go to a church, they are organizing go back to school projects. All these are done by money. Somebody, somebody will say that in, in those days, there, there were no air conditions, there were no funds, they were so ministering under, you know, um, canopies. And mm -hmm. why, why go into air conditions and funds? Excellent, excellent. It's something that is, is going to make your overhead go high. Why go into it? I 100% I like your question because <laughs> the reason is that those days, they did not have the things we have now. Mm. And they still needed people to give. Okay. Then we would need more people to give to do what they did. And as you said, those days, there were no air conditions. I agree, granted. But the issue is that if you want to have a service in New York and you go under a tree, who will come there? <laughs> so I will hear the church from a business point of view. Good. So the whole point is that the church matches its society. Mm. So if I go to a village and nobody lives in the house right now, I will not build a house as a church. So the church, wherever the church is situated, it is culturally contextual. Mm. So that is why when we go out for evangelism, we dress like the people. We try to let the people know that you can be like us. Mm. We can be like you and still Jesus will love you. So the church needs those buildings now because they are having concerts. Beyonce and the rest are having meetings in ultra modern places. And we cannot take the church to places that people in this society would not love to be. And mm. I pray we don't have church service and people are finding themselves, people are sweating, and, and we have to be giving excuses to them. So I want to encourage everybody, especially those of us in this, in this modern society, that we need to equip the church so that when people from the world come to the church, they will have no reason to despise the church. Mm. Already, already our message is foolishness to them. Mm. But we are putting the gospel to them as foolishness in their hearing. Don't make our churches look foolish to them. Don't make them come to our church and ridicule because our microphones is giving double sound. Oh. And they wonder that if your God is such a great God, if your God is such an excellent God, see where you meet him. See why, why are you miserable like that? <laughs> so I, I want us to have that understanding that I am a firm believer in having nice churches. I am a firm supporter in us having modern churches. But that does not take the place of the gospel. That does not take the place of the ministry of the word. That does not take the place of prayer. So in us preaching, in us praying, we must ensure and give to ensure that the church, the church, the church stands out. There is a beautiful scripture I read recently when Paul was writing to the, the church in Corinth. He made a profound statement which made me sit back and, and, and I'm like, this, this, is, this is a key cornerstone for me. Mm. 
I, I will read for 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 us. Please go ahead. I will read for us. It is coming. He was talking to the church and he told them that Jesus will reign in the church. Jesus will lead the church and they should not forget that Jesus is the glory of the church. That is in first, second Corinthians chapter eight, verse 23, second Corinthians chapter eight, verse 23. I read, if anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker concerning you. Or if your brethren are inquired about, they are messengers of the churches the glory of Christ. So he was trying to introduce Titus to the church in Corinth, and he was telling them, if anybody questions you who he is, he's a partner with me. He's a messenger of Christ. The glory of the church. So the church is the glory of Jesus Christ. Christ. What we do in the church brings glory to Jesus Christ. So anybody who don't understand this will be confused. Why are we doing this? Why are we investing in this? Because the church, both the spiritual church and the physical church, is the glory of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. So one reason is to ensure that we can pay people to dedicate their time. Number two is to ensure the smooth running of the church. I pray, I pray, and I sympathize with, with, with churches that are struggling because they can't pay their rent. But thanks be to God that throughout the years, he's always found faithful men and women who are given to the church. The church needs money. When we are organizing outreaches, we need money. When we want, when we want to be, make an impact in the society, the church needs money. When we want to organize giftings to the society so that they will know that we are significant, we, we are contributing, we need money to do these things. So the next thing that leads to this is, what are the avenues the church can get money? What are the avenues? The first avenue is that Jesus expected us to finance the church. The church is not supposed to be financed by the world. The church, the the United Nations will never give money to the church. The United States government will never give money to the church. The IRS will not take taxes and say, churches, this is your share. So (laughs) the world will never finance the church. It must be us believers. It must be those of us in the church. Then the church is not a business center. Jesus clearly told us when you read John chapter 2, when he went into the temple, he says that this place is not a marketplace. So the church is not a business center where I'll come with business ideas and, and use that to get money from people. The church runs on people giving to the Lord, on people giving to the Lord. And if you go through scriptures, our fathers and the, the founders of faith have established standard ways that we give to the church. The first one is tight. Right. It's, 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 it's none of this, I should say before I even go to them, none of this, none of these means of giving is, is, is to extract money from you without your will. Everything I'm saying is willing giving. Mm. You have to understand and do it willingly. The first standard of giving to the church is tight. And that is 10% of your income. Mm -hmm. I know there are so many many debates. I know people are talking about it's an Old Testament regard that that, 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 that was mandated by the law. But if you critically analyze, tithing predated the law. Abraham Mm -hmm. tithed. There was no law. Jacob tithed. There was no law. And yeah. Jacob made it interesting says that of all that you will give me, I'll give 10% to you. Right. Mm-hmm. And those days there was no church. So what they did is that they burnt those things as I've given it to God. Mm-hmm. In our days, there is a church. There is a place that you can give that. And when you tithe, I don't care what basis you use it. You're just making a statement that of all my income, God has a part. Sure. Don't think about the law. Don't think about this was the law. No, Abraham tithed before the law. But when you tithe, you're just making a statement that of all that I make, 10% belongs to God. And God honors that. If you do this willingly, if you do this with good understanding, God will bless you because God loves a cheerful giver. If when you give this cheerfully and willingly, God will bless it. 
God yeah. will honor it. So I want to encourage you. The church needs money to run and do its business. And the means, number one, is tithing. Every Christian, every person of faith in our church must tithe because we believe in tithing. Number two is offering. Offering is, is anything, any money that you're giving as, 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 as a sacrifice of praise, as, as, as an attitude of, of thanksgiving. So tithe and offering is the main means that we give to support the church. And there are other voluntary or targeted giving where maybe your church is buying a building, where maybe your church is buying a new instrument that you give towards that. So in all these things, every member is contributing. And that was what happened in the first church. Everybody contributed based on their strength. So if you make 10,000 a month, you take 1,000. If I make 1,000 a month, I take 100. We are all giving based on our strength. And when we do that, God honors that. And the church flourishes. The church flourishes. The other thing I would, I would want to say, if you don't have any questions with regards to... All right, so um, I just wanted to let our viewers and our listeners know that um, we're coming to you live from the Pensa Conference Northeast here in New Jersey. Uh, I'm sitting in for Elder Alote and I have Pastor Dr. Captain Berima. We're sharing on the church and money. Um, we, we talked about the tithe, that you have to come in with the 10% of your tithe, and that is specific of all your total income. Let's look at the offering. Is it specific that do you have to purpose in your heart that I'm going to check? This is the amount I will want to give as an offering. Or once they call, okay, this offering, I just go and put in anything. That, that's a very good question. So usually Paul told the church in Corinth when you read uh, uh, the First Corinthians chapter 9 to 11, he was trying to advise them about when they come together, they are given. And he told them everyone should purpose in their heart. Yeah. So the ideal thing is that you, you must have something on your heart that you're going to give. As an offering. And it, as an offering, it, it is the ideal. Do we always plan it? No. There are no. times you get to church, you, 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 you realize that, oh, let me give more than, than what I have of me. Mm. But the whole essence of, of all this is that if we see giving in church as an act of worship, we, mm. we will take it seriously. We will take it seriously. And many people, I know somebody may be watching it right now and be like, no, I give to the poor. I do this. I do. And it's one of the arguments you keep hearing over and over. And I tell people that I give to the poor too. And maybe I give more to the poor than you do. Yeah. Maybe the church I pastor give more to the poor than you do. But we cannot come and stand in the church and list the members we've given to. Because that, that is unscriptural. But uh, Giving to the poor and giving to the church are not against each other. Mm. It's not mutually exclusive that once I give to the church, I can give to the poor. And people come with this funny debate, oh, well, when I'm going to pay my tax, and someone calls that they are sick and they, 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 they need money. And when I hear all this, I'm like, why are you struggling to give reasons why you won't tithe? That is why I wanted us to go. We're trying to put meaning to all these things when somebody will buy drums for the church and so this month I'm not giving my tithe. I'm going to write that in the check, uh, in, in the card that, uh, you know, I bought drums of $3,000. So I will put into, as against my tithe. Is that biblical? So, so the, whole, the whole premise of, of tithing is to bring it to the house and leave it to the Levi, the leaders, the church presbytery. To decide on what to do with it. So I can come to a church and say, I'm going to build a new building for you, whether you like it or not. And that's my tithe. Maybe they are doing a project that would need more of the funds. But mm. granted, if God lays on your heart to buy a drum, drum for the church, and let's say it takes all your money. Let's say you make 3000 you know, and the drum is worth uh, 2000 I get it. You, you're basically giving all your money to that investment, that project. Mm. So I, I wouldn't come and debate with you and be, uh, and be legalistic. No, even though you bought 2000 the 1000 that's left paid tight on it. That is when we become like the Pharisees. We are, mm. we are now becoming legalistic. We've done this, take this from it. No, God expects us to do all this with a voluntary and a love and a happy heart. The difference between us, our titan, and the titan of old is that they did it out of obligation. God was demanding that out of That's them, a sign of obedience. For us, it's voluntary. We are doing this 
as a sign of our love and our appreciation for him and our worship for him. Those are two different goals. And that's why I want to encourage believers in this generation that let us see giving in church as an act of worship. Yes. If you see like that, a lot of these excuses will go away. And one day I was telling a brother and I told him that it's good to give to the poor, but do you think giving to the poor will take them to heaven? So mm. let's say I feed all the homeless people in Hawaii till they die. Would that make them go to heaven? Mm. And he said, no. And I'm like, what will make them go to heaven? And he said, believing in Jesus Christ. And I'm like, so the best gift you can give to the poor is to tell them about Jesus before you give them any money. Because you can feed the poor to hell. You can feed the homeless to hell. You can give to the homeless and you're giving to them and eventually they're going to go to hell. And what is the business of the church is to save souls. So when you give to the church, you are empowering the church to give the best gift to people, more than money, more than food, so that their souls will be saved. I want to encourage all of us, let us become givers in the church. And the, the, the extension to this conversation, this discussion, is that every believer also must be sure where they are putting their money. I'm encouraging you to give to the church. I'm encouraging you to tithe. I'm encouraging you to give offering. I'm encouraging you to do targeted giving. But you must know where you're putting your money. There are a lot of schemes on televisions seeking money from people with promises that are not scriptural. Oh, give $36 and you get 36 blessings. Give, give. So they are enticing people and you see it all over on Christian television and believers are falling prey to it. These are not churches, they are parachurch organizations. I'm not saying don't give, but know where your money is going to. Mm. Whatever you're giving, know where your money is going to. And you must not be gullible enough to hear, give $56 and you get 56 blessing. What is the scriptural basis? <laughs> the scriptural basis of giving in the New Testament is voluntary and giving knowing that you're giving unto God and God loves a cheerful giver. We are not giving as a means to entice God. I see if I give $100, God will have no other means but to give me back a but thousand. To multiply that for you. Not to, yeah, multiply that. We give as an act of worship. Mm. And I want to encourage you, know where you're taking your money to. Don't put on your television and be sending money to ministries who are not accountable to you. Don't be sending money to ministries whom you cannot even trust that they are doing what they are doing. A lot of have pictures from Africa telling you they are giving it to the poor. What is the evidence that the money you're giving truly is going to the poor people? The, the reason to ask these questions is so that you give to the right places. There are ministries doing that, and they will show you. They will give you the evidence of what your money is going to do. Then you can support it. But one of the safest places you can give is your home church, where you go to church. Because at least you see what is going there. At least when the year ends, they will give a report of what the, the resources have been used for. And when you know these safe places, give to God in those places. I want to encourage everybody listening to us. When you neglect giving in the church, you are depriving the church of a vital resource to do its work. One brother I, I, I met in Hinesville, Brother Wusu, he said that the reason why we have to be rich in the church was that when Jesus even died, none of his, his disciples had enough resources to buy a tomb. That, 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 that's a very huge statement there. I was talking to Attorney Chris and they can, they can um, know that just I walked in before we started this program. We are doing this uh, Northeast Pencil program in a hotel. Mm -hmm. So I asked them, don't we have any African or any Christian who has a hotel that we can even go? They said, no. So what do we use our resources for? Come to my next question. There are people who give their fights outside of their church, but they still, for instance, they stay in your church in Hawaii. They came out, come under your feet. You feed them with the word. They fellowship there. But they give their tithe to somebody sitting in Africa. Is that biblical? And what do you have to say? It, it is not. And, and it is because these people don't understand what, what, what they, are, they are doing. Because the reason is that the reason why a lot of people are sending money to Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, Cameroon, is because these pastors there make them believe as if they, you, you owe this 
this responsibility to this yes. church. Mm. But where you are fellowshipping, where you are being fed, where you are part of, is where you give your time. Yes. It's where you give your resources. You can help them once in a while, but if you're part of this assembly, that is where you must focus to build. And that there is this strange deception in people's mind, thinking that when they pray on a prayer line linked to Ghana, it's more powerful than they pray in the church. It is the same Holy Spirit. It's the same God. I want to disabuse the minds of people. God is nearer you than you think. And if you focus what, what, on your picture, what, what, what is the church doing wrong? That I can't sit under your feet as my shepherd and still be being, um, getting food from somebody else. What is wrong with the church? So, so I, 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 I put it twofold. I can't fit into that. No, 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 no. I put it in twofold. That's a very good question. And it's good we are talking about this. First, for us as shepherds and leaders to know and for the members to also realize I put it twofold. So first, I blame some of us leaders, elders, deacons, and pastors. Mm. I blame us because we are not providing the avenue for them to, 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 to explore and experience miracles, experience divine authority, which is given to the church. So if we are in the church and we're not creating an avenue for people to pray, we are not mm-hmm. having all nights no more. We are not having extended prayers no more. So it's as if any time we come to church, it's quick service. Everybody is in a hurry so that we can meet time and close. The people will still feel hungry. The people will still come and be yearning for more. Because the beautiful thing about the Holy Spirit is that once you taste of him, you will desire more. Once you, you, you want more of him, you feel there is more. And number two, people have challenges. The devil is real. So people have real spiritual challenges. So if we are leading them and we are not meeting that need, we are not targeting prayers, we are not laying hands, we are not doing these things that are targeted to liberating people from the challenges of life and the attacks of the enemy, they will go somewhere. So I blame leadership first, but I also blame the members in a way because many of our members are gullible. Mm. Yeah, easily. A pastor just starts sharing a story and, 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 and they don't even question it. Is this, is this even true? Where did this happen? Okay, if you're saying that you went to that service and people were falling, the blind were, eyes were opening, why isn't it happening when you come here? Yeah. So when I hear people whose stories are always, when I went there, when I went to this yeah. church, when I went to them, I'm like, you are here now. Whatever yeah. happened that the same God is here, do it. Yeah. So if if every time your miracles and the testimonies you give me are outside my experiences, I will have questions. So our members are easily deceived by these pastors who are lying. They are lying to them. They are giving them false hope because it's not what God is telling them. So we should train our members first to be able to judge and see, is this even true? And we should create an avenue so that they can enjoy the services we have with them. And they wouldn't follow anybody. So that, that comes in with a discernment of spirit. So be able to identify that this person is fake. This person is not even telling the truth. This person is in for, for your money. Is there an up, uh, other um, point that you have when it comes to um, resources in inflow of money? You've talked about offering. you talked about voluntary giving and then the fights as well. So the, the other thing I would want to add is that when you read Acts of the Apostles, you realize that when they gave the money to the church, it was also of benefit to the poor in the church. Mm. So I want people to know that the church is doing a lot for those in need in the church. The only way we can continue is when people continue to give. Mm-hmm. The only way some of these, these, and we cannot come and stand and give a list. The 10 people the church gave money to this month, we cannot. But don't assume we are not doing it. Mm. So let us give to support the church. And, and, and I will extend that to also say that there are a lot of devil pushed ideas going about. Is the devil responsible for it? Making Christians feel tired in giving. First of all, they are tired of giving. Number two, also making people criticize and make them think that it, it, the church does not need their money or they should not give in the church. It's not of God. If you read through scripture, 
when the Israelites even left Egypt, the first thing God asked them is when they were making says, bring all the gold that you got. Mm-hmm. And they brought it and brought it and brought it to the tent that Moses had enough, take it back. We don't yeah. need any more. But God was telling them that if you have to do something for me, I will demand it out of you. Mm-hmm. God is not going to pour money from heaven into the church because his principle is that we must fund the church. We must do his business. When Jesus came on earth, Jesus could do anything, but he needed people to give to his ministry. He, that is how the church is made to run. But unfortunately, there are liars, there are scammers who have invaded the church field to steal money from people, to make it, to, 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 to spoil this, this avenue because they know that there are people who they can get money easily from. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about your genuine church that you know is of God. That is where your resources must go. And the church will be accountable to you. When you give to the church, at the end of the year, the church must be accountable. When you give towards a project, the church must be accountable. And that is the only way we can, we can show that we are different from the liars out there. Pastor, let's, let's look at fundraising. Is it one of the options that a church can use as a means of inflow of income to these funds in the church? Yes, and, and I believe yeah, that, 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 that is one of the, one of the means fundraising. I, I, I hope I'm not controversial here. <laughs> but I believe that the, the, the fundamental, I, this is my personal theology. I always tell my wife, when we are discussing scriptures, I get up and I'm like, this is my personal theology. <laughs> Even though I subscribe to the theology of our church, my personal theology in regards to this, that the fundamental means the church will be sustained and the church, God expects the church to, to, to get resources, a true tithe and offering. Fundraising must be occasional and it must be targeted. So we don't raise really funds blindly. Mm. Fundraising must be targeted to a project. It sure. must be targeted to something that outside our Titan offering, we need this to, to, to project us. We need uh-huh. this to be able to complete this project. So fundraising should be something that it should not become the, the, the weekly offering. That every day you want to raise every day raising funds. funds. It should be targeted to a project and on occasion. And as our church, and which I believe is biblical, the church must be self-financing, uh, self And Thank so you. if we're doing a project, we must be able to, if our Titan offering will not be able to sustain that or be able to do that, then there is a need for us to raise funds. But that must be clearly explained to the yeah. people. The people should know and understand why we're doing what we're doing, one. And number two, it must be done in a way that they don't feel compelled, mm-hmm. that they don't feel, they don't, they don't it, it, you can do fundraising in a way that people are giving up because they're, as a, it's an act of worship, or, but they, they feel compelled. And some people even make statements that God is not telling them and it's not scriptural. So I was going, they bring in scriptures and trying to wind people and squeeze people and make it seem like it is true. It, 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 it is dangerous, and that is one of the things we, we, I want to encourage everybody who raise funds. I've seen National Head raise funds, and I see how he does it without first. He came to Hawaii, and we, 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 raised, we needed to raise money to transition to a new place. He raised money from in the church, and the people were laughing while they were giving because the, 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 the sense of compassion compulsion was not there mm. what you can give there's a target whatever you can give let's meet that target and that should be the goal of giving i i, I want us people come and they're saying things i see we make god is not driven by money mm. i guess yes god, god is not influenced by money i said i give this money all of a sudden god ignores everything he has to do whatever i'm asking no if you're not living right with him you can give him a billion dollars. It won't even make him blink. He right. is not. He is not interested in money. Okay. He is not driven by money. We need the money to do his work on earth. Mm-hmm. 
So we, we should not get to the point of making people feel as if if you can't give God a sad, if you can't give God will neglect you, if you can't give God will not bless you. No, I'm telling everybody listening to me, God has already blessed you. He has already blessed you. You give as a, as a show of the blessing of God mm -hmm. in your life. God has given you. He has given it to you already. He loves a cheerful giver. He will reward your giving. But I want you to know that when you are giving, Give with a cheerful heart, a yes. willing heart. But don't be cajoled, don't be lied to. And there are times people use scriptures and the scripture has nothing to do with money. money. But they try to make the scripture so that people will, will give out of emotionalism. There is mm. no blessing in it. So, when Pastor, you, let your wife be aware that I'm also in this with you, um, that fundraising is geared towards a target. I believe we did the same in, in Maryland when we were renovating our place we had to get the total budget. Then we had to pull young men and women together. Who can take this? Who can take this? The initial project that came was huge. So we said, well, let's get into it. And once we came together and said, okay, somebody said, we'll take carpet and somebody said, I'll take um, chairs. And the church was relieved mm -hmm. from that. Um, to bring more to your point, you know, we're raising funds for the the Ghana Prisons Project. Mm -hmm. When the chairman came in, we went to bronze. Because it was geared towards a project in fundraising, there and there, $80,000 $80, was raised. And today, they have broken grounds. They are building the prisons in Edura. Um, and out of that, they are, still, they are using the, some of the prisoners to build then more than 10 of them have given their life to Christ. Really beautiful. So this is something that is geared towards a target and it's helping people. Before we go on, let, let's backtrack a little bit in when running of the church in, in terms of money. Should, do you believe that ministers of the gospel, let me put it this way, shepherds should have some kind of money management skills? That, that is a very, that is a very can be well managed, can be well distributed. So somebody knows, okay, my money has gone in there. I've given it to God, but you know, it is towards the kingdom of the gospel. But the person leading us is not managing the funds well. Should we have shepherds or ministers go through management when it comes to God's money? I, I, I strongly believe, I, 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 that is a very strong, good question. And I believe that it is one of the, uh, the things we leaders, presiding elders, elders, and pastors especially should be scared of. Mm. Because when I was, when I used to work, I used to, I, told, I was working in a warehouse when I came to, to, to the United States early before I started, I could get write the exams for my license. And I'll go to work and I'll come home tired, so exhausted. And I told my wife that, it is scary if people will go and, and labor like this and will take money and bring it to the church and the church mismanages it. It's scary mm -hmm. for whoever is mismanaging it. So if you're dealing with the money people are giving in the name of God, mm -hmm. you must, you must equip yourself. Sure. You must equip yourself so that you don't waste the resources. It's easy to waste it. Sure. It is easy. And one of the things that I believe we must all have is that that is why God has gifted the church with so many talent. I may not have that gift, but I need to empower the, the treasurer. I need to empower the, yeah, the um, financial secretary that you know it. If we are demanding this and it doesn't make sense, stop it. Question it. No, so let's give money to this. Let's give money to this. And you, the financial secretary, you have the know-how. And you know that this is not good management practice. Because you have, you, you're going to have pastors who are going to come in to know we need this. It's a mass. We have, that's why I'm bringing that question up there. Is it an advice that you would want to see our ministers go through financial training so that they know that the resources is not for them? It is for the kingdom of the gospel. I 100% I agree. And during my ministerial formation, I think Elder Nyaku gave us a, brief, a good overview. About, but I, a good overview, trying to prepare us and equip us to know how to manage money. He did. But I strongly agree with you that 
it should be extended into deeper management skills, yes. even to ensure that we can get best value for money. A lot of times we want to buy, we want to do this project. The first person that shows up is like, it's you. But maybe we can we can sample people, bring this. So these are things that we 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 can learn so that the church properly administers its resources, not just even money, how we use our church building. How, how, how we, we, we can ensure that we, we can get the best out of it without mm. rather paying all the mortgage. What are the other means? People have the know-how. And, and this is totally all in ensuring that the church has resources to be effective. So I 100% agree. And will you want to rent, rent your church out to somebody else to do like an evening service or you know, something? You want to use a facility to raise income? Why not? There, there's nothing wrong with it. The only reason when I, I was a presiding elder in the church and a group came, the only reason, the only thing I asked of them, bring your doctrine. Mm. If your doctrine is in line with us, why not? It's the same master. Mm. I, 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 I get it. I don't understand why people are so protective. If we allow another church in, it should be done with wisdom. So l- let me backtrack and say this. When you're going to take that kind of decision, you should do it with wisdom because there are some people they will come in the church and before you realize they will break yours. They will come as targeting your members. What about parties? Uh, so this is, my, this is one of my personal theologies. If we have a fellowship hall, if mm. we have a fellowship hall, I don't mind. But I am, I am hesitant giving the actual sanctuaries for any party except if it's the church's own. It's so if the church is having a Christmas get-together, of mm. course we can have can it, in do it in the sanctuary. Yeah, but giving it to birthday parties, giving it to, to any other party, I'm, I'm a little hesitant. Mm. And the reason is that we, we cannot ignore the fact that if we've dedicated the sanctuary to fellowship, it, it, must, be, it, it must stay dedicated to that purpose. So I wouldn't want to rent a funeral and everything is happening in the same sanctuary. But if there is a fellowship hall, that is the essence of the fellowship hall. You can rent it out and raise money to support the kingdom. And and I pray, I pray, which I believe it will happen soon, that our churches, that by the grace of God, which is in 2023, we are are acquiring a lot of landed properties that Mm -hmm. will move into daycares. We will move into, into these projects that... First of all, it's not just for the money. My, my, my children go to Christian Academy. It's owned by Assemblies of God here. It's one of the best schools in Hawaii. And they teach me scriptures. They come home. There is no contemporary song my five-year-old can sing. Do you know mm. what? They go to break, and these are the songs being played to them. as mm. they are And they teach them the word of God. And in addition, they teach them good knowledge. Best school in Hawaii. Wow. So I want to. I know we will get there, but these are all the things you're raising that should prompt the leadership. Mm-hmm. And you go to that church. Of course, the school will fund everything. The school, I can guarantee that. Looking at the numbers, the school pays the mortgage. The school, and the interesting thing is that the worship leader is the music teacher in the school. All wow. the teachers are Sunday school teachers. The teachers they meet in in school. They meet them in the school. In church. So basically, the church is even employing its own. So oh. I think that there, there are more avenues that God is going to open our church to, and we, we must be ready for it. But for sure, the generation after us, the generation you're doing Pensa with, I have stro- they are going to bring a revival in the church, and we, we will get to that level that we won't even be talking about money because we have gotten to the point we have systems in place to ensure that there's continuous flow of resources into the church. Well, this is the puppet discussion live from the Northeast um, Pensa Conference here in uh, New Jersey, one of the hotels here. Uh, we, we're doing the puppet discussion. I'm sitting in for Elder Samson Alote. I have with me Pastor Dr. Captain Nanabe. I, I will always want to add the, <laughs> the captain to it. Is there any final comments that you want to raise before we, we wrap it up? So thank you very much. All I want to add is that if you're in a church and you're not giving to that church, you're, you're not being a good member. You're, mm. you're, not, you're not being a good, I don't want to say responsible member. No matter what you make, there is something you can give in the church. More than just showing up, mm. you can give your resources. 
and you start with tithing, I want to, I want to encourage you. If you tithe and you lack, call me a liar. If you start tithing and you lack, God does not restore. God does not give back to you. Call me a liar. And if your church is doing any project, it's for us. It's for us. God is expecting us to do it in our days. So God bless all of you. And those of you at the personal conference, give. It's for the church. Support what the church is doing because the church is yours. And it's, it's, we are setting the table up for you so that you have a very successful and a good church. God bless you. Thank you, Adam Sam. For, Bless you very much. Uh, it's, it's been a wonderful discussion with you. I believe we have to um, do it more, more especially what Titan is, how to tithe, bring okay, so people will get the understanding um, of tithe that they can do it and do it well. There are blessings associated um, with tithe that God has instructed us to do. Before we go, um, we want to give somebody an opportunity and to give his or her, her life to Christ, you may be fighting somewhere and um, giving money to somebody else, but you don't even know the God you are giving it to. You just in there, just to let's say you are sick, you looking for documentations, you going through problems, so you want to give out money to somebody to pray for you, but really behind it, you don't know this Jesus that we are talking about. I want to give you an opportunity to give your life to Jesus, that you will know Him for yourself. And have that an encounter with him. So once you are dealing with God, it becomes very easy and flexible to open up the windows of heaven. So Pastor, you want us to lead us into a time of acceptance of Christ. Thank you. Uh, and as our, our dear elder said, that is the best decision you can take, giving your life to Jesus. Maybe you are listening to us. Maybe you even argue and ask me talking. But I mm. want to ask you, you know Jesus for yourself. If you know Jesus, if you've accepted Jesus, that is the surest way, the only way to eternal life. So if you want to take that decision, I want to share this prayer with you. Say, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I, I give you my heart today. Give you my heart today. Forgive me my sins. Forgive me my sins. Become my savior. Become my savior. From this day. From this day. I will live for you. I will live for you. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Um, b before we wrap it up, I think there are some comments that came in. I want us to go through that quickly. Coming from um, New York, one where I say Pastor touched on an area I had um, commented earlier that the church hierarchy is bound to be accountable at all times. And he came back and said that let's not assume that not all listeners are members of our dear church. I would therefore suggest our discussions cover some general questions that arise in the church in general. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Moses Jesse Brown. So what we will do is uh, we will cut in across most of, of the, the church. So we will spread our tentacles and look at the church in general. Um, he's saying that we're narrowing it to our local uh, church of Pentecost setting. But if we open it up, let others also who are not members of church of Pentecost know that they can identify so they can also be of help to wherever they, they are fellowshipping as well. Now that's a good point. And, and I, I, I greatly respect that. God bless our brother. And as I said, the church must account. When it mm. comes to finances, resources, it is, it is, it is expected of us. Mm. Paul, Paul collected money, brought it to the apostles in, in Jerusalem, and he accounted mm. for it. Mm. And when they were even sending the money, Paul sent two people. He didn't say, well, then, oh, ask this brother, take the money to the church. He said, no, 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 no. For accountability's sake, sure, let sure. people carry the money to Jerusalem. So if you, if you're in, there's, there's no ministry that should make finances a, a mysterious thing. As when you give, you don't hear anything. No, there must, there must be accountability. Something, something sacred that, oh, no. No, no, no. No, nobody comes close to it. There sure. must be accountability sure. to ensure that People are at, at rest, and people know that whatever we're giving, that there is clarity in purpose. Mm. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Dr. Captain Nana Berima, for this wonderful discussion on the church and, and the money. I believe next week, um, Elder Alote will continue from there as well. May the good Lord bless you and keep you safe, increase you, 
the more you share um, to us, I pray that the Lord increase you and increase your family and the Hawaiian church. All the God bless you, and we'll see you same time, same station on COP US Radio next week. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of the Pensa conference today. Thank you. I'm watching you guys on Facebook, so <laughs> thank you very much. God bless you. Call to duty the militant church partisan assembly of the Church of Pentecost. It's on the move. Seven days of prayer and fasting from July 8th to the 14th, 2019. That the gates of hell shall not prevail. Put on a whole armor of God, draw your sword of the word. With precision, get involved. Time 6.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. each night. 8 p.m. to 12.30 p.m. half night service on the Friday day. Leave the crowd behind and get involved. For more information, call the numbers on your screen. Don't be dropped out.